Right. Thank you. So, uh, indeed, uh, the last talk today will be fairly technical. And I will not present much motivation because it was excellently presented in other lectures today and yesterday. So I'll talk about semi-classical propagation estimates. In fact, I put online the notes for this talk. They don't have much value uh, except they are an insurance in case I run, run out of time and somehow don't finish some estimate, then I could send you to the notes. Now, a more proper account of this is available in a particular in a book uh, joined with uh, Maciek Zworski, which is, uh, the title is on the board. It's uh, just been published by AMS. I believe it should go in print in September, so this month. Hmm? They delayed it by one month? Well, okay, I'll see you next month then. What's, I'm, I'm here to sell the book and that's, <laughs> well, you can buy it, you can buy it, you just can't get it, but you can pay AMS. Um, Appendix E.4 towards the end of the book has significant amount of detail about what I'm going to present. So I'll start by a quick review of notation that I'm going to use. And in process, I will also introduce semi-classical pseudo-differential operators very briefly, which I believe might be used in Maciek Zworski's Friday's lecture. So what are these? I'll restrict myself to a compact manifold for the time being. And then I'll call psi kh the algebra of semi-classical pseudo-differential operators of order k on this manifold. They work like usual pseudo-differential operators, except they depend on the semi-classical parameter h. And if you want to think of them as quantizations of symbols, you should put h next to differentiation. Uh, the symbols that we'll use are the standard kohn nuremberg symbols, and we will not will somehow assume that the estimates are uniform in H. So yeah, these are really families of operators. Everything is a family depending on H, but I'll largely sweep it under the rug. In fact, if you want for a majority of the stock, you can just take H equals to one and you get a special case that was already uh, presented by Andros, I believe, yesterday, you know, with all the proofs still applying. Now the principal symbol is going to now be a quotient by the space h times sk minus 1. So you can determine the principal symbol of a semi-classical pseudo-differential operator invariantly, modula operators one order lowering psi and also decaying like h. Simply because, you know, well, I multiply my h by derivative there, so you should get an improvement in h as well. And then accordingly, if the principal symbol is, equals to, is equal to 0, in this uh, quotient class, then A lies in one order lower to the differential class, and it's O large of H in this class, okay? So it's just largely a review of notation. I'm not really trying to introduce the semi-classical algebra properly here. As I said, if you're not familiar with the H's, you can put H equals to one for now, and uh, that will still uh, give you a non-trivial statement. All right. What else do we have? Well, we have the semi-classical Sobolev space. This, oh, maybe this one. Okay. I'll denote H as H of M. And so those have H-dependent norms. You'd put H times differentiation in those. Um, and to the differential operators in psi kh act natural on these spaces. So again, this was already covered when h equals to one, and the analogs are very straightforward. Or you can look at the book uh, to see the details. Now, what else do we have? Well, um, we have two important sets associated to an operator: the elliptic set. There was one piece of good. Oh, here it is. Who brought this one? I want to get more of that. There's one piece of hope for the future speakers. This is the one you should be using. Um, elliptic set. So this is, I'll denote it LH of A. And so that's inside T star M. And that's the places where the semi-classical principal symbol is non-zero. In a certain uniform way with quotient classes and so on. And there is the wavefront set which I will denote without the prime. So this is the one that Andrus Vashi called wavefront set prime. 
But really, it's neither wave front set nor wave front set prime. So wave front set H of A is also in T star M. And morally speaking, wave front set of a quantization of some symbol is the essential support of the symbol. And this is places near which A is not H infinity psi to the minus infinity. So without the H, wave front set is a conical set that just tells you directions so that there is no conical neighborhood of this direction which the symbol decays rapidly, so faster than any power of psi. Here I also had the power of H. Right? And both of these are actually not just subsets of T star M. It's much more convenient to view them as subsets of the fiber radially compactified cotangent bundle, which was introduced yesterday. Because that allows you to talk about what happens as psi goes to infinity as if you have a boundary. So this T star M bar is T star M together with points where psi is equal to infinity. And this is diffeomorphic to the sphere bundle. So you somehow add these directions at infinity. Right? So that was uh, already covered in great detail yesterday. So I'll, I'll be using it. All right. So then this elliptic set is an open set, and the wave front set is uh, closed. Well, here it's a compact set, because this is a compact manifold. All right, so I'll be using those. Any questions about that? All right. Um, hmm? No. Uh, it, it depends on the, in, in the book they are, but that doesn't, that's a question of convenience. Uh, for the purpose of estimates, you know, the estimate is each for each h. You, you, you don't need somehow the values of the operator of the symbol for different h to be related to each other. You just need uniform bounds as h goes to zero. So that's the general motive of all these semi-classical estimates, that you need uniform bounds as h approaches zero. So all the constants will be uniform, all these constants are uniform, and so on. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, in particular, they, they will apply when h is equal to 1. All right. So this is this quick review. And now, without further ado, let me state what Andros called the estimate version of propagation of singularities. So this is the first estimate. As promised, the talk is rather technical today. So I'll try to deliver a fair approximation to a proof of that. So the setting is going to be the follows. You know, it's all about solving equations, right? And what's the equation that I'm going to be solving? I'm going to be solving this equation. P minus IQ, U equals F. So there is an operator, and I will choose to split it into real and imaginary part, as we'll see in a moment. It will be convenient for me notationally. Uh, I believe Anders just called it P, but that's uh, it's my personal choice how I write my operator. Now, for simplicity, I will assume that u and v are smooth, well, u and thus f are smooth functions on m. If time permits, or if somebody asks a question at the end, I will, can you hear me? I can see some people cringing. Is it, am I too loud or too, too loud? Well, I've been told that the sound level is regulated automatically, so. So I'll assume they're smooth. I'll talk, you know, if somebody asks a question, I'll talk about the non, somehow non-trivial non situations when you relax these assumptions. So what are P and Q? My P is going to be an operator of order one. So I'll only do propagation of singularities for first order operators, such as vector fields that made their appearance uh, in the previous lecture. And my Q will be a sub-principal part. So this one will be an H psi 0 h of m. And I will assume that they're both self-adjoint. So I fix some density on m, and I assume they're self-adjoint. So I split my operator into real and imaginary part. And I assume it's real principle. That's, that's all that I've done so far. Now, I'm going to look at the principal symbol of capital P. So that's in principle an equivalence class. However, to make my life nicer or easier, I will assume that this 
equivalence class has a representative. I'm not going to write this on the board, which is H independent. And just like in Andrush's lecture, homogeneous of degree one. Well, for me, it's enough to do it for large xi. Okay. So these are the assumptions. So this is, uh, I'm really presenting this as a general statement. As long as you have an operator satisfying these assumptions, you will get the estimate presented below. And the other talks uh, somehow provide motivation for why you would want an estimate like that. Okay. And then a key object that we'll be using is the Hamiltonian flow of P. So this is well defined on the cotangent bundle. And because of this homogeneity of P, it extends to a flow on the compactified cotangent bundle, which is tangent to the fiber infinity. So tangent to this psi equal infinity piece that we added. Right? So that's the objects that I'll be using. And so now here's the theorem. So this is propagation of singularities. Um, it can be stated in several different ways. And as I said, I'll choose the estimate version. So you'll have to bear with me for a little bit. Let's see, I can, of course, try to, um, let's see, should I be original? Well, let's see. Assume A, B, and B1. I believe Andros called this B1, B2, B3, if you're correlating with those nodes. But I'll try to stick to the annotation that's in that particular book. So uh, our operators of order 0, so this is something that I can use to micro-localize my function. Applying those to a, to a function u is like localizing it or taking a piece of it in phase space. And I'll assume that they satisfy the following control condition. Maybe I'll draw a picture first. I'm, I don't think I'll use color chalk because it's very difficult to erase. But let's say this is the flow lines of e to the thp. Okay, okay so these are things like that. And now I'll assume that I have the following situation. So this is the wave front set of A. This is the elliptic set of B. And this bigger thing is the elliptic set of B1. Now, what do I mean by this picture? Maybe I'll put it here. For every point rho in the wave front set of A, so rho is not the defining function here. I just use rho to write x xi. I apologize for that notation. There exists some capital T and R, such that two conditions are met, e to the minus thp. Of course, for now, it doesn't matter if it's plus or minus, because t could be positive or negative, of rho is an elliptic set of B. And e to the minus little thp of rho is an elliptic set of B1 when t is between 0 and t, or between t and 0, depending on the sign of capital T. So what it says is the following. We have this compactified cotangent bundle. The wavefront set of A is a compact subset of it. These two elliptic sets are open subsets of it. The flow is well defined on this bundle. It's a, it's a compact manifold. The flow is tangent to the boundary. So it's uh, you know, as, as, as good as you could imagine, kind of topological situation. And what I'm saying is that I want that for each point in the wavefront set of A, if I flow backwards or forwards, again, I didn't specify the sign of t currently, then eventually I will cross the elliptic set of B. So my A is controlled by B. Somehow you should think of A as being in the future and B as being in the past. When we get the estimate, that's what it will mean. And the intervening part of the trajectory, so the trajectory in between, is inside elliptic set of B1. 
Okay, so that's the assumption that I make. Then we have the following estimate, so I'll call this star. And the estimate is like this. Well, for every s, for every n, exists c. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's all the quantifiers I need. Au and hsh is bounded by constant. Bu in hsh plus constant h inverse b1f in hsh plus remainder constant h to n norm u in any negative Sokolov space, like that. I don't, hopefully this is still visible. Okay. So that's the estimate. That's what we'll be proving. Now this looks a bit dry, but what's, uh, you know, maybe I can talk just two minutes about, uh, or re remind you why this estimate is useful to study. <laughs> so here, um, what's happening is, I want to estimate my u somewhere microlocally, and what this tells me is that, well, imagine first that my f was zero. Imagine I'm just solving p minus iq, u is equal to zero. Then I see that I can estimate my function microlocally in some region if I could estimate it in the past according to this uh, Hamiltonian flow. So here I have a dynamical condition that the wave set of A is controlled by the elliptic set of B. And the conclusion is that I can control the mass of the solution to the differential equation on A by its mass on B, plus this remainder, which always happens in microlocal arguments. And then, so this is, this is like the future is determined by the past. You should think a bit of some kind of evolution problem, and B would be like specifying the Cauchy data at initial time. But this is a microlocal version of this. All right. And I should also say that there is a wavefront set interpretation. There is a notion of semi-classical wavefront set, which I don't have the time to introduce today. Maybe it'll make an appearance later. And this estimate, following the argument that Andres presented yesterday, tells you that if f is equal to zero, then the semi-classical wavefront set of u is invariant under the Hamiltonian flow. And if f is not equal to zero, you can see that this also specifies you where you need to measure the right-hand side. So somehow I knew I had no money, and then I received no money, so I still have no money. You know, I have no singularity, and in between, no singularity appeared, so at a later time, there is no singularity. All right, so this is why this is called propagation of singularities. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that part at that. So that's the estimate that we want. And another feature that I believe probably will also appear is that you can see that compared to elliptic estimates, which actually, well, there were some elliptic estimates presented, you see that uh, the way we measure the right-hand side, it loses a negative power of h, and it also loses in the regularity class, because this is a first-order operator estimate, so you would think that you would say, get h1 norm from the L2 norm of the right-hand side, but instead you get the L2 norm of the left-hand side from the L2 norm of the right-hand side. And that's characteristic of the proof, this is not a, this is not a de de defect of the proof, that's somehow the best thing that, that is true. And we'll see, uh, if, you, if you follow the proof closely, you'll see where it comes up. All right, so uh, what should I do now? Perhaps I'll um, erase this and see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, great. And prove this. All right. So. And there are many proofs of this theorem, but um, so this is going to be part three. I'll present one which is a positive commutator argument. It's a classic proof, it's beautiful, but it's not really easy to conveniently stick it all into one lecture. So I'm going to make a few simplifications, which seems like I made something very, very special, but in fact, the way, the way the proof goes, these are fairly minor. So the idea, hopefully, will still go through. And so I'll do a proof in the model case. There are many model cases you could consider. 
but there is one which is particularly nice. So my compact manifold will be R. Um, my operator will be h dx, so it's minus i h partial x. So that's in psi 1 h, all right? This is also, you know, as, as much as r is a compact manifold, this is in an also vector field, don't, in a kind of trivial way. And um, then the symbol, the principal symbol is just psi. Then the Hamiltonian flow of this, well, if we solve Hamilton's equations with that, we see that we shift x by t and uh, leave psi intact, right? So the Hamiltonian flow is just translation in x when along lines psi equals constant, which makes this uh, con you know, con condition there easier to, uh, to digest, perhaps. Now, well, I also, you know, I, I can introduce a Q, and for me it will be H times a zeroth order operator. Well, what's a natural zeroth order operator? It's a multiplication operator, and for silly technical reason, I'm going to assume it's a smooth compactly supported function on R, okay? And so then the equation that we're solving is actually a differential equation. So what we have here, maybe I'll write it here, minus ih partial x minus ihq u is equal to f. That's the equation. It's an OD. First order OD this, with this potential just to make it a bit more fun. And you can see where h inverse should come out, right? Because, you know, if I try to prove this using OD methods, which I encourage you to do, this is a, you know, this is a fun way to do things. Uh, you see that, well, f should be divided by h. <laughs> All right, and then um, what happens next? Well, I have these operators a, b, and b1, and I'm going to simplify them too. I'm going to assume they are multiplication operators. So a, b, and b1 is going to be just multiplication operators. by functions little a, b, and b1, which will be smooth, compactly supported on R. Okay. So of course, maybe I should remind you, if you take a function depending only on x, you take its quantization, you get multiplication operator by this. Okay. So I'm demicrolocalizing it, but then I'll present the microlocal proof in this demicrolocalized setting. And then, um, well, I don't have much room there, so I'm going to draw my control condition here. Opa. Okay, so we're solving an OD that we know very well how to solve. So I'll assume that T is greater or equal than zero in the control condition. That's not a moot assumption. Of course, you can flip the sign of capital T by just replacing capital P by minus P. And then, you know, everything goes backwards. But the way the construction works, it's actually fixing a sign of T is useful for me at this point. And then I'll just, uh, I'll just draw a picture of what this A, B, and B1 are. So here's my X. Now here's my a, it's somewhere here. Okay, well that's not a function, okay. Okay, this is b, and here is b1. Okay, okay now I'll, I'll argue by pictures in a few places because hopefully you can intuitively see, for instance, that the control condition holds for those. <laughs> Because remember, the flow does nothing to xi. My symbols here are independent of xi. So xi, you can just ignore it. And then you just for any point in the support of A, well, you go backwards along the flow, which is partial x. You hit this, and you stay in B1. Okay? So that's my, that's my setting. And what I'll show, I'll show estimate for s equals 0. So for s equals to zero, all these fancy sobolev spaces are just L2. 
And so the estimate will be like this. I'll call it maybe star prime. Norm AU in L2 is bounded by constant norm BU in L2 plus constant H inverse norm B1F in L2. And there's no remainder. This is, you know, the setting is so, so nice that there is no remainder. So I'll, I'll have to address that fact at some point. Okay, but that's the estimate. Now again, exercise, prove that using ODE techniques. What you see here is a fundamental theorem of calculus. Here you can really see this is like an initial value problem for partial x, because you have control on BU in L2, so this is like U at the initial time. You want control for AU at a later time, and assuming Q equals zero, you have also control of the derivative in between A and B. So this is really fundamental theorem of calculus. Value of u here is equal to value of u there plus integral in between. And then using that, you can convert it to these L2 estimates. It kind of looks silly, but that's, um, that's what you can do here. Um, all right, but I'm not going to, uh, of course, do the SOD proof. I'll use this as an opportunity to present the, the actual uh, microlocal proof of this. So how do we prove this? All right, I think it's time to erase this. <clears throat> so, so voila, the overly complicated proof of this statement. Step one is a construction of what uh, I call it an escape function. Maybe because I come from scattering theory. People sometimes call it multiplier or weight, depending on what method they use. But the, the, these functions play, you know, the, the, the role is similar. Yes. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to exploit this dynamical condition to construct a certain function that I'm going to stick into my positive commutator argument. So it's a simple step in the sense that even in the general case, it's just calculus. It's just multivariable calculus. But that's an important one. That's where we pass from dynamics to analysis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix some number. I'll choose it later. We'll see where. So this is going to depend somehow on the imaginary part of our operator. And I'm going to take this escape function which is going to be smooth, compactly supported on R. It's going to be non-negative. And it'll have the following properties. So these are the properties that I'll need for the proof. One, it's positive on support of A. Two, it's derivative. So I'll call it G prime, but so this is just partial xG is Let's not recall then minus C zero G near, so that's where C zero comes up, near the places where B is equal to zero. So near in a neighborhood, that's a closed set, so there exists a neighborhood in which this inequality holds. And three is that support of G is in places where B one is not equal to zero. Okay. It's a simple three conditions. And the existence of this escape function, you see the, the conditions involve all of the A, B, and B1. And the existence of this escape function is basically it's equivalent to the control condition. So how do you con construct a function like this on this graph? Well, I'll try to do it by picture. It's always a little bit difficult. Um, my drawing is not very good. But you see, what we want is we want, well, the function should be non-negative. It shouldn't be identically zero, so okay, well, if I, and it should be sufficiently decreasing, except where b is not equal to zero. So what we do is the following. Well, this function has to start like zero, and it has to stay like zero until you hit b. And then, well, then it can do whatever it wants, so I'm going to make it grow a lot. And then once it leaves the support of b, it has to decay. And it still has to be positive 
in a support of A, and then it has to touch down here so that the support is inside B1. So that's my G. Voila, the function. Okay. And you might be worried about this C0, but what you can do is you can always take G of x into the minus C0x. And so if this derivative was just non-positive, multiply by that, you get this condition. All right. So this is this auxiliary function. Again, you can check that existence of this function is actually equivalent to the control condition. Right. It's, it's a good exercise to check, actually, that. All right. Now, so what's, uh, what's the next thing? Well, the next thing is the place where the actual analysis comes up. And so this is what Andres briefly explained yesterday. And that's the commutator identity. Well, morally, versions of this proof have existed for a while. But I think it's fair to say that this, this particular way of writing it is due to Hermander. I don't know. I'm, I'm too junior to make statements like that. But if anybody wants to ob object at this point or be silent forever. <laughs> OK, so this is all. Everything is due to Hermander. Um, and this is the following identity. By the way, if you're a seasoned microlocal analyst and you're bored, uh, as an exercise, check this just using integration by parts and not using any fancy notation with p star and commutators. It's a fun, it's a fun thing to do, actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the imaginary part of f and g square u. I'm going to call this 1. This is going to be my term 1. It's good because it has f in it. I, I'd like to have my right-hand side somewhere. Now, this is the same as, it's not clear why, why, this is, uh, why else this is good, but this is imaginary part p minus iq u, comma u, like that. All the inner products will be in L2. All norms will be in L2 in this basic proof. Yeah, I think, oh, g squared u, right? And this I'll, I'll split into two parts. So this is going to be imaginary part, well, the part that comes from P, P U G U. And I'll call this 2. So 1 is 2 minus uh, real part of Q U G square U. So that's where the imaginary part went. And that's plus 3. Okay. So it's a simple identity. 1 is equal to 2 plus 3. Did I? Oh, g squared. It's not clear why g squared is useful, but we'll see in a moment. It's, it's good to know. Because g squared u comma u is something that's like a norm square of something. So that's uh, step two. And the terms on the right-hand side, the term three is something that we'll have to get rid of. And the term two is the part that's going to help us. That's really where, they, where this positive commutator business comes up. So the key uh, identity is write out this imaginary part using the commutator. And so I'll write it. Two is one over two i times this inner product, p u g square u, minus the complex conjugate, which I can write by switching the sign here. So here, at some point, I'll be using that u is smooth. That's somehow, if u was non smooth, that's where problems will start appearing. And that's the same as 1 over 2i. Now, I'm going to use the fact that p is self-adjoint and g is self-adjoint. Well, g is multiplication operator. So I'll have g square p u u minus p g square u u. That's where I use that p is self-adjoint. And now we have the commutator, right? This g square p minus p g squared. So this is going to be, I always, uh, it's i over 2 the inner product of the commutator of p g square u u. And what is this? Well, in our simple setting, there is an explicit, uh, explicit formula for that, right? Because p is a differentiation operator, and g is a multiplication operator. So I'll, I'll spare you the couple lines of calculation. They'll tell you that this is exactly h times the inner product of g g prime u comma u. Well, this, this small computation never ceases to amaze me, because try doing it without complex numbers. I mean, obviously, it should be possible, but this is, 
it's kind of interesting that we prove statements about these things that could be real valued by employing the imaginary part of something. It's something slightly mysterious in it, at least for me. Okay? So that's the step two. We did this computation. Now, going to, let's see, what should I erase? I think I can erase all of that. Now, that was step two of the proof. We somehow, uh, we found our commutator. And now step three is estimating. So we have one equals to two plus three. One is a good term because it involves the um, F. Right? This also looks like energy estimate because these are expressions quadratic in U. You know, it's like estimates with squares, but they're written in this neat form that uh, makes them very generally applicable. And so one is bounded by norm of F times, uh, well, constant, depending on the size of G, times norm of GU, so I split off one G. Two, two is, um, well, what's happening with two is that's where our G and G prime came out, and we have this condition on the sign of G prime. So if G was somehow a compactly supported function that had negative derivative everywhere, that obviously doesn't happen, then, we could bound this by minus h times you know, g squared u, just by, by that condition there. Now this inequality that we're using is not valid on near, you know, near the support of b, or strictly inside where b is non-zero. And so what we get is we get some constant. Well, we get minus c0 h norm g u squared, I believe, yes. And then there is a price to pay because, again, the inequality for our escape function is violated where b is non-zero. So we pay the price here, and it will be ch norm bu squared. A calculus exercise to check that if I take capital C large enough, depending on g and on b, I can arrange this for, to be true. Okay. So now if b wasn't there, then this term wouldn't be needed because g prime would be everywhere negative. Okay, three. Well, what's happening with three is that it's bounded by C1H norm GU squared, where C1 is the supremum of this uh, potential Q. Right, so I just bound it by norm. Right, I already had uh, H in my capital Q, and then I get this. So when I put all of these together, remembering that one is equal to two plus three, well, what I should do is I have a good negative term here and a bad positive term here. And so that's where I, this C0, which was a constant that we needed in the construction of escape function, should be, you know, should be strictly greater than the constant that comes out of the estimation of the imaginary part. So that's where we choose it. And then when we add everything together, we see that you know, two plus three is bounded by minus HGU squared, and then there is this other term. And so what we get is we get HGU squared is no more than constant HBU squared plus constant F times GU. Now here you see that u is uh, used quadratically everywhere except here. And so a simple, uh, I think this is called the peter pole inequality, uh, will tell you that this implies that gu squared, or gu just like that, is bounded by constant bu plus ch inverse fu. And then, well, we estimated g applied to u, but since G is positive on the support of A. We know that uh, F, sorry, not F U, <laughs> B1F. And I can put a B1 for free there. That's where I use the support of G. And then when we, uh, we see that AU is no more than constant GU by property 1. 
and that finishes the proof. Right. So that's where I use property one of the escape function. This part is where we use property two. This part is where we use property three to be able to put in B1 there. And this part doesn't care for what the escape function was. Right. So that's, uh, I think, as, uh, as, as primitive as I can do a uh, presentation of the uh, positive commutator proof. Any questions about that? Okay. So it was a simple identity. We had the commutator popped out, and then we had the terms coming from the right-hand side, which are good because it involves the right-hand side and only involves u to the first power. And then we had two kind of quadratic terms in u, one coming from the commutator where we use the sign condition to use it to bound u in a place where we want it. And the other term came from the imaginary part. And that one we just brute force bounded. So I'll use the escape function to, uh, to get rid of that one. All right. So that is, um, is it. All right. Now, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to actually explain how to get from this special case to the general case in any proper way. But I should note that. This expression still uh, makes sense. The only thing that you do is instead of g squared u, you take, let's say, g star g u, where capital G is now a quantization of some escape function. And for the escape function, here, instead of this derivative, you use derivative with respect to the Hamiltonian flow of p. And so when you do this little identity, you see that what pops out of the commutator, well, the principal symbol of the commutator will be the differential of g squared with respect to the Hamiltonian flow. And that's why we need the sign condition on that. And then everything else is estimated similarly, except you get errors. Because this is, you know, the um, semi-classical expansions are not exact. They always come with some lower order terms. And so those could be removed iteratively, which is a, a important but somewhat tedious and maybe not the most essential part of the argument. So I'll spare you that. I'll refer to the book for that. OK, so that finishes, um, almost finishes a proof of propagation of singularities for me. So as I said, I don't want to talk about how to get rid of the errors. But I do want to uh, mention one thing that's going to be useful, and namely, in this model case, I cheated in many ways. I chose my favorite operators, P and Q. I chose my favorite cutoffs just to be multiplication operators. But I also put S equals to 0. So what happens if you want to do general S? Let's see. Maybe I will here. So what if you want to prove this estimate for general values of S? So on a, on a different space. And so there are many ways to think about it. But one way is by conjugation. And so proving this estimate star on the space HSH is the same as proving this estimate on L2 for the conjugated operator, P minus IQ S, which is, I always forget which way the conjugation goes is HD to the power S, P minus IQ, HD to the minus S, where these operators are just, you know, they're there to change the uh, differentiability order of the space. They, they're th the ones that convert L2 into HS and back. And so these will be quantizations of Japanese bracket psi to the power S plus, you know, low-order terms. And so proving the estimate on HS is the same as proving the estimate on L2, but for a conjugated operator. That, that part should be more or less uh, uh, feasible. So now we just have to compute this conjugated operator and see if the estimate applies. And what happens is, for instance, if I take the conjugation of P, S, what is this? So there is a neat identity. It sounds like something would be complicated to compute, but it's actually not. Because this is the same as capital P plus 
the commutator of H, T, S, you know, these are inverses of each other, comma P, H, D to the minus S. Check that. And then we have a formula for the symbol of the commutator. And so what this will get me is this will get me P uh, plus I, H, S, the quantization of Xi inverse H, P, Xi. So this is uh, the Japanese bracket of Xi is a function of the cotangent bound with respect to some metric. I take HP of that, I get order zero, uh, well, I get order, right, I get order one thing, and then I take this. So I get this as an order zero operator, and then plus H, you know, plus lower order terms. So what happens is, that's the effect that this, um, that this conjugation has on the operator is that P minus IQ S is going to be P minus IQ tilde plus dots, where Q tilde is Q plus this uh, Q minus S quantization of Xi inverse HP Xi. So the conjugated operator has the same form, but this imaginary part gets this extra zeroth order term, which um, h here, which comes, uh, which somehow depends on uh, little p and on this s. Okay. And so this is an operator to which the original estimate applies, and so that's how you know you get estimates on h s. So this sounds like a minor point, but I'm going to use it later. So that's one, one of the things that you have to do if you're proving the general case. You have to, of course, address how to do it in every Sobolev space. Now let's see. So now I want to talk about radial estimates. They, they were also advertised. And I think I'll have time barely to state one of these two radial estimates. For the other one, I'll refer you to lecture notes. And so this is a high regularity radial estimate. And it's the following. So assume PQ UF as before, so as I just erased. And I'm going to assume that L, that I'm given a radial set or radial source. So I'll have to uh, write this out. So this is the fiber infinity. This is psi equals infinity. Is a radial source for the Hamiltonian flow of P. And what does this mean? This means that this is a compact subset of the fiber infinity. I'll present an example in a moment, but I should really state the general theorem. First, we are given a compact subset of the fiber infinity, so boundary of this compactified cotangent bundle. Um, I want it to be flow invariant. It doesn't have to be a nice set, actually, which is nice. It just has to be compact and flow invariant. Um, <clears throat> in fact, in applications to Anosa flows, it is not a smooth manifold. Um, and then, what does it mean to be a source for this flow? Well, this means there is a neighborhood U of L in this fiber radially compactified cotangent bundle, such that E to the, you know, for every row in U, uniformly in row, in as a matter of fact, E to the minus THP of rho converges to L as T goes to infinity. That's what it means to be a source. If you're somehow close enough and you go backwards, you converge to L. And what does it mean to be a radial source? This means that absolute value Xi will go to infinity exponentially fast on these trajectories. So a picture should be like this. Here is partial T star M, like that. Here's my L. 
the, here's the rest of the fiber radially compactified thing. And here's the flow, and the flow should look like this. So here's my U. If I start anywhere in U, I go backwards along the flow, I converge to L. And if I see, if I trace what happens to absolute value of Xi, so 1 over the boundary defining function, if you want to view it this way, it should go to infinity exponentially fast. So that's the definition. All right. So that's the first part of the theorem. And let's see, where do I, where do I want to, this kind of all, uh, well, OK, I'll erase this part, maybe. Maybe I'll be fine here. This is the assumption. And what's the conclusion? The conclusion is actually something very curious. So there exists a 0, a, and b1 in uh, psi 0 h, such that l is an elliptic set of a. So basically, a can microlocal as you near l. And we have that for every s bigger than a 0, the norm of a u in h s h is bounded by constant h inverse norm b1 f in h s h plus the usual remainder. So it is a very curious statement because it's, not some, it's something that looks too good to be true. Namely, propagation of singularities told us that somehow singularities can run, but they, they cannot hide. Somehow, if you control your solution backwards along the flow, then you control it at a later time as well. Here, there is no capital B on the right-hand side. That, that's what's so curious about this estimate when you see it from a usual propagation point of view. There is no control term. So for instance, if f is equal to 0, then we know immediately that our u has to just be small near the source. This certainly doesn't follow from propagation of singularities, because if you try to estimate your function here, well, you could control it by a smaller neighborhood of L. But L itself is flow invariant. You somehow cannot get rid of that. And yet it's true, but there is a price to pay. You need to, you can only prove it in high enough regularity class. And so if u is not c infinity, you have to assume that u is above this threshold regularity for the estimate to be true, as we will see on our model case. So how do we prove this? Well, the proof is actually simpler in some sense than, than the statement, <laughs> at least in the model case. Let's see. I just need to find it. Let's see. Where is it? So here is um, so here is the example. So what's the basic case when this radial estimate appears? It's this operator h, so on R h x dx minus i h over two. Because remember, I want my p to be self-adjoint, so that makes it self-adjoint. Now my little p is x times xi. The flow is going to look something very different. It's going to look like e to the minus tx, no, e to the tx, e to the minus txi. That's the Hamiltonian flow of x times xi. It's this hyperbolic flow. Now, I'm going to assume that my q is a constant. Okay. And I'll still have these multiplication operators like that. Okay. So I just put an x in front of the thing. And that, I claim, is an example of a radial set. Or uh, you know, oh, what's L? L here will be x equals 0 and xi equals plus minus infinity. So there are two things that I have time to say. One, why? is this operator in the setting to which this uh, radial sets theorem applies. So that's where we can see a concrete example of a situation. Oh, that is bad. Well, okay. I'm erasing what I'm going to use, but I think we'll just have to live with that at this point. And so if we draw the picture of the Hamiltonian flow, well, what is this? This is uh, x equals 0, xi equals 0. And then we should have something like this, right? Okay. 
I'm drawing the Hamiltonian flow of x times xi. It's there. Now I have to compactify it, however. So this is xi equals 0. And let's say this is xi equals infinity. And minus infinity looks similarly. I just I won't draw it. And so here is my piece of L. Here is x equals 0, xi equals infinity. And then you see that the flow actually has this form on it. You know, in the x direction, you already had a source. Right? It's x partial x minus xi partial xi. That's the vector field. And in the xi direction, you, you go to lower xi, but you know, here you're going away from infinity. So if you look at what this looks like in the compactified picture, then you, you will actually see something that looks like that. So it is a radial source. Now, the other thing that I think I have time to explain is why would an estimate, uh, why would the radial estimate be true in this setting? And for that, I'll have to, so what's, so model K is estimate or model estimate. Well, the simplest case to consider is when little q is bigger than 0 and s is equal to 0. We'll see in a moment why. So I'm just doing my estimate on L2, which is the simplest setting. And I assume that my sub, my sub principal imaginary part is negative. You know, I had a choice of this q. And then the estimate will be then like this. AU is no more than constant h inverse b1f. Well, and nothing. We won't have any remainder, just like in the previous model case. And the way you do it is you do it by the same positive commutator method that I did not erase there on purpose. And you use the following. So here's my A. Here's my B1. And this is 0. This is where the, the radial source is. And here is G. You figure out which properties it should have. But well, we'll see in a moment. It looks like that. Because if we go back to this argument there, forget about these properties. Just look at the terms we have. We see that the term 1 is still fine. It's still controlled by the right-hand side. That's 1. The term 2 worries me a little bit. But the term 2, remember, is what? It's just h x g g prime u u. Now, when I do commutator with x partial x, this x comes out. Okay. Now, you see that this is non-negative because x, well, g, g is non-negative. And x g prime is also non-negative. Here's my bump function. You see, x x g prime is non-negative. You can certainly arrange it this way, non-positive. So this term has a good sign. You know, we're bounding expressions from above. This term has a good sign, but it doesn't help me. Well, it doesn't make my life worse, but it doesn't give me somehow control on u. But the third term, if you compute it, is nothing else but minus q norm g u squared. And this helps. Right? So put together, these terms allow me q h to estimate g u as before. So it's just now it's the sub principles, the imaginary part that I can use to drag out control on, the, uh, on GU. And this part, just it doesn't hurt me. It has the correct sign. And so then you can see by following exactly the same argument that you get this estimate. So I suppose the last thing I should say is, well, what happens for general S? General S and Q. So where does this regularity condition come in? And the place it comes in is, remember, there was this other piece that I raised that what we need to do to prove an estimate on HS is we need to conjugate our operator by something. And that was P minus IQ tilde plus stuff. And Q tilde was Q minus wherever it was. Really? I have two more pages? No. No, I don't. No, I don't. Don't worry. Q tilde was um, somewhere there. Anybody remember what Q tilde was? I just don't want to screw up the sign. One moment. 
Okay, here it is. Minus s, quantization of xi to the minus 1 hp xi. And now what happens here is this is the change in the sub-principal part, in the imaginary part of the symbol that we get by changing the order of the space. And you can compute that if this is a radial source, this expression is negative on L. Compute it. You might get confused with the pluses or minuses, but you know the basic case is this. In the basic case, xi inverse h p xi, that's the same as xi h p xi, and that's just minus xi inverse. That's just that's minus one, right? Because my h p was there x partial x minus xi partial xi. And so you see that if s is large enough, then by changing s, we can somehow push ourselves to sufficiently nice, you know, to, 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 to having the positive subprincipal part, in which case the previous argument applies. So this is maybe not the full details of how radial estimates are proved, but I think it's fairly faithful with, uh, you know, with the um, technology that was used and the, the ideas that are used to actually prove something like that. All right, I'm sorry for running over and any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe over the reception. Right. So among a few details that I might have mentioned if I, um, if I somehow managed to, to, uh, uh, to go faster in the beginning, was that if you go to this argument, so here I did this very basic argument. Now if you try to repeat this argument in the full microlocal setting or just have pseudo differential operators and so on, you see that all that matters here is that the, the symbol, the principal symbol of Q be positive on the radial set. Once it's positive on the radial set, of course it's positive in a neighborhood, and we are only arguing in a neighborhood of this set. And so that's why you only care for this to be, you know, you can compute this as negative on the radial set. In fact, I lied here in the sense that for general radial sets, you know, the flow doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be fixed on L. The radial points that Andres mentioned there, the flow is fixed, it consists of fixed points. But that doesn't have to be like that here. So actually, you have to choose this function slightly carefully so that this exponential convergence of absolute value xi to infinity is converted to this being negative everywhere. But that's maybe more on the technical details side. Yeah. And so you, yeah, you, you, you just, you know, they, I mean, the general mantra is that the, the principle, this Q, it, uh, one sign of Q makes your life worse, and if, if Q is the right sign, if Q is non, non, if Q is non negative, and you are estimating the future by the past, then it helps you, and then you can dial, you know, you, you can change this Q by changing the order of the space, and so you can bump yourself into a place where it helps you. Maybe a slightly technical explanation of why it works. Yes? Oh, this? Yeah. Right. So in the model case, we had no remainders. Right? In the model case, when I write, so there are two things that happened. Okay, so this we estimated using Cauchy Riemann, and that's fairly safe, except in putting B1, but that's not the worst part. So there are two parts. One is we related the commutator to HPG, and that carries errors in, in general. There we just had commutator of partial x and multiplication operator. That's an exact formula. But in general, you would get an error, higher order in h and lower order in differentiation. Here, uh, we also you know, had to use something. But the point is, you, you, you had this. And then at some point, we converted our knowledge of the sign of this to some kind of uh, estimate for the operator. And that's done using sharp gordian inequality, which I completely did not mention. And that has errors, errors too. So you accumulate these errors, which are better in H and better in differentiation order. And so you get this error, which originally would be this. So what you get originally is you get H to the 1 half, and here you get this. 
And then you iteratively improve it. So you just apply this many, many times and you estimate there. And every time you get extra one half power, extra minus n. And then, you know, if you do it many times, then you get any power of h. So that's where, that's where h to the n comes up. Yeah, that's also one of these more technical parts that the model case didn't have. I think we're good. Oh, you have a question. You have a question, really? Uh, for minus p, yes. And there is another radial estimate that I will not state because I'm out of time. Right, psi, psi goes this. Right. Oh, red, yes. Right. You know, if you've never seen that, you know, there are some things that need reading, but you can check manually. There's a good exercise for fiber radial compactification. Everybody who's paid by MSRI in this program has to check. I'll, I'll make sure, Andres makes sure, has to check that for the fiber radial compactification for this particular model, this is a source. This you can check. And I suggest you do. But not today. All right.